Welcome back to another session on Texas PPR review, this one of the certification exams for Texas teachers. Today we're going to discuss competency eight, student engagement strategies and motivation. So competency eight is pretty interesting in that it basically has two separate parts. The first part is primarily how to engage students and to motivate students in general. And then the second part focuses on how we can specifically instruct and support our English language learners. And we're going to discuss both sections today. So to begin, first we should discuss engagement principles. So remember when we talk about engagement in the education context, we're talking about having student, students paying attention to what you're teaching them, and having them actively involved. Either they're actively thinking, they're actively working on something, or they're um, communicating their point of view, either through oral communication out loud or through written communication. So there's some strategies to engage students. One of the first strategies is to make content relevant to the students themselves. So um, as much as possible, try to connect what you're teaching to students' interests, their personal life, their home cultures, their prior experiences, and even their future goals and career interests. If you can show the importance of the lesson and really make it personal to students, students are much more likely to pay attention to what you have to say. Second of all, it's very important that you also provide active learning opportunities. So some active learning opportunities could be having students answer questions or asking each other questions, um, having a discussion with their classmates, writing down something um, they think they have concluded or decided upon, researching information and looking up additional facts so that they can later present what they learned to the class. All of those are active learning opportunities. The opposite of active learning would be passive learning and that would be primarily just students listening to a lecture. That would not be ideal because unfortunately um, if all of your instruction is just you teaching through a lecture format to students especially the younger students are going to become pretty um, disengaged pretty quickly. So as much as possible, you want have to have your lessons have active involvement of students where they're doing it, doing the process or practicing the skills with you. And as much as possible, having your activities hands on where they're um, physically doing and representing their knowledge. A third engagement principle is to provide opportunities for cooperative learning. So one, there are different types of cooperative learning, but one of the most popular forms is called project-based learning. And so in project-based learning situations, students are assigned a real-world problem, and they work with a group to come up with a solution based on researching. And then later students present their research to the class and then based on feedback from peers and from their um, their teacher and maybe if based on their implementation of their findings they later modify their conclusion based on um, what they've learned from others and from implementing it in real life so basically when people try out their solution and then later they refine their solution based on how the implementation went. Um, something that we'll talk about a little later is that cooperative learning is very important that you provide each student with a specific job and you want to make sure that you provide opportunities for students to change roles, to have different types of opportunities to be let's say the group leader or the recorder who writes down the facts or presents it or the, uh, maybe the communicator, the person who, who orally communicates the findings to the class. So you want to have different roles for students so that students have opportunities to practice with different types of positions. Also, you want to make sure you hold your students accountable so they have to turn in something, some real product that you could really check to see that they were on task and they were doing what they were supposed to do. 
Um, a fourth principle for engagement is to provide students with increased choices. So many times you can see this through uh, when you're providing independent activities um, or guided practice opportunities for students or even assessments. Giving students different choices of how they can represent their knowledge can be very powerful. Um, for example, you might choose at the end of a unit to have students show what they learned through writing it, giving them the option to write an essay, make a creative project like making a piece of art or song or rap or do a play, having them create a digital presentation, maybe doing an oral presentation, or having them complete a multiple choice test if they would prefer that. So giving students options and variety not only provides um, opportunities to see different types of learning for students, but also students get to pick which format they are the most effective at representing what they know. And so students appreciate having those choices. If students feel like they have more autonomy and choices, they're more likely to have, an, um, to have investment and to have a vested interest in what they're doing in their work. A fifth principle is to make sure that you're incorporating higher order or critical thinking skills. They've done research and students tend to be less engaged if they're just having to memorize facts or restate um, definitions or terms. Those lower level skills are kind of boring for students. Basically, they're just repeating what someone else told them. Instead, you want to challenge them to think for themselves. You want them to also be able to have extended thinking opportunities where they're having to elaborate and justify their conclusion. So we want to make sure we use those higher order thinking skills of application where they're applying what they learn to something new or um, analysis where they're comparing and contrasting two pieces of information or two theories or two ideas. Or it could also be evaluation where they're making a judgment statement or choosing which is the most important and why or explaining why what they learned was important for the world in general. And then finally, also one of the highest levels of critical thinking skills involves individual creation where students create their own original work to represent what they've learned in their own um, way. And so it kind of incorporates what we talked about with having giving students choice while also challenging them with higher order critical thinking skills when you have them create their own representation of what they've learned. Another way to engage students is to have activities that involve inductive thinking. So inductive thinking is basically when you're giving students individual clues or individual pieces of information, and then they have to kind of piece it together and form a conclusion based on um, what they've seen. So you might, for example, give students several different objects and have them experiment whether or not these objects sink or float. And then you might have students create their own conclusion why do you think certain objects sink and certain objects float? And then later, after students present their conclusions based on their experiment, you can later refine it and help them uh, kind of restate in formal academic terms what was the key theory or law that you learned. So students like being problem solvers or detectives. So inductive thinking opportunities are great opportunities for students to think for themselves and to come to their own conclusions instead of you just telling them the general law, theory, or rule and then having them apply it. Another engagement principle would be inquiry-based teaching. And um, inquiry-based teaching is very similar to the problem-based learning I talked about earlier. Um, here's the, the full process. So first of all, students formulate a problem so they determine what is something that's pressing in their communities or what would they like to learn more about. Then they do observations where they think about how they have personally experienced this issue or what they have seen in their own lives. 
Then they do investigation or research using academic sources. Then they, um, based on that research and their personal experiences, they analyze and come to a conclusion about what they think would be a possible solution. Then they communicate their solution to the general public, and then they reconsider or rethink about their solutions and modify their solutions to consider how they could best implement the solution in the real world. And how could they determine whether or not their solution was effective or not? What criteria would they use or test they would take to see if they were effective in implementing what they proposed? Another engagement principle could be role playing. Um, so role playing could look like having the students um, research a historical figure and then dress up and act like that historical figure. Or it could be a student acting out a situation like they were one of the main characters in a story or modeling what a certain job profession might do. So um, maybe internships in some ways are a form of role playing in that students are learning from experts but they're also having opportunities to practice in the real world a specific skill or occupation and that's a form of uh, role playing but for older students. And this is very similar simulations. So um, giving students real world situations, having them um, design a specific task that they could implement in their lives. And so this would be also similar to project-based learning, but maybe a little bit less rigid in its structure. It would be more like you giving a hands-on demonstration or having students um, putting students in charge of a certain task. Like, for example, for your music students, you might have them create their own marching formation. Or um, for your engineering students or your science students, you might have them solve an environmental problem in the outside the school community. Classroom discussions and debates are further activity that can be very engaging for students. Just make sure that you incorporate all students, so you need to keep track of who is talking um, and make sure that students have equal opportunities to participate. And you also want to think about maybe some discussion starters for when students stop and they don't really have much to say. And um, you also need to think of ways that students could maybe make their own comments, maybe write down their comments or their thoughts on let's say a pull everywhere internet document or some form where if a student is not currently being the one chosen to speak they still have a way to um, write down or, or jot down what they're thinking before you move on to another student. So basically just making sure all students have opportunities to share their point of view either orally out loud or in written form. And the benefit of these are it also challenges students to think on their feet. And so that kind of uncertainty and that challenge um, can really excite students because it's, un it's different, um, it's unusual. They're, having, they're put on the spot and if you do it in an appropriate way in a risk-free environment where students feel supported by their colleagues, it can be a fun challenge that's not overwhelming or daunting. So you really have to be careful in how you present and implement those discussions or debates. Also, just like we talked about in other competencies, you want to make sure you hear different points of view. So you don't want to just call on the same student or the same, the same group of students that have similar points of view. You want to hear from all different students and validate all different students' point of views. Another way to support engagement is to have different grouping strategies for students. And grouping strategies will also help with the element of collaborative learning. So as much as possible, you want to group students with mixed ability in mixed groups or mixed ability groups. So you want to have groups of students that have a variety of academic levels. So you might have some advanced students, some students that are on grade level, and also some students that are maybe RTI tier two or tier three that are slightly below grade level and need additional support. You also want to have students of various um, language abilities as well. You want 
to have a mixture of native English speakers, also um, maybe beginner and intermediate English language learners, and also some advanced and advanced high English language learners. So you want to have mixed groups, and the primary reason for this is because it benefits both the advanced students as well as the students that need additional support. So first of all, the advanced students have opportunities to um, teach things in their own way, and they, they have to relearn the concept because they're helping their peers. And so in many ways, they develop more depth because they're actually having to be able to explain it in their own words to someone else. Uh, and so sometimes uh, students, advanced students also develop an increased confidence and increased um, collaboration skills and uh, presentation skills. This is probably even more important. The students who are struggling or need additional support really benefit from having a peer explain something to them in a different way. Maybe they didn't understand what the teacher was saying to them or the way in which uh, it was presented in the textbook or, or however, but seeing the information explained to them using words that they understand that's explained to them by a peer is very beneficial. Um, students also learn the importance of collaboration and supporting each other. One thing to note is that you want to make sure that you change groups regularly. You want students to have opportunities to work with different types of people. If they stay in the same group, um, eventually there could be the students could get tired of each other or they might become too close and it becomes more of a social group and less of a a work group and you want and you want to have once again expose students to different points of view and different cultures and different perspectives and so having students work with different genders and different cultures and different groups of people and different types of learners are it's very beneficial one way to avoid any conflict with students who who might get frustrated because let's say they really enjoy working with their group that they were assigned with is that you could tell them at the beginning of the year that um, one expectation is that you are going to switch your groups every week. And so that's just something that's the reality, that's the norm. You can explain why you're doing it, your rationale. But then um, if you introduce that at the beginning, up front, students know what to expect. And so when you do change groups, it's not uh, an overwhelming or frustrating situation for many students. So... It's also important that you think about how are you going to assess students when they are engaging in active learning. We talked about the importance of active learning, but how can we assess students on the spot without interrupting their active learning, without interrupting what they're doing, their discussions, their hands-on learning experiences, their writing? Well, first of all, you could do ongoing assessment. So basically, ongoing assessment would be you observing students at each stage of the activity and giving feedback, but also um, assessing whether students are being successful. And if students need additional support, you could stop the activity and help them. Um, and you could also use your ongoing assessment of how students are progressing to modify future assignments or future activities based on what students need and what they previously turned in or their work product and also maybe based on their level of engagement in the activity. If they were really engaged in activity, you might give them similar activities, but if they seem kind of lost or disengaged with an activity, you might modify future activities to change up the pace so that students are more engaged. Another thing that's important is to make sure it is to provide authentic assessment. So authentic assessment is a great way to um, have students be evaluated on their learning, but in a fun, exciting way that is also beneficial and meaningful to students. So an authentic assessment could be a real world product. So maybe having students turn in an experiment or demonstrate an experiment and turn in a lab report, do a model, ha have a discussion, create a digital project, create an art project or creative project like a song or rap. All of those 
authentic assessments are related to things that they could do in the real world, a real world and authentic task, but they're also fun and engaging ways that students can demonstrate their learning while you can also make sure that they're on the right track and they're understanding the concepts. So one thing to note about engagement is there is something to do, not just something, but a significant amount of engagement involves motivation. So first of all, there's two different types of motivation. There's intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. Sorry, I have allergies. <laughs> So intrinsic motivation is where the student is primarily motivated by the task or the activity itself. They're really enjoying learning about that or engaging in that skill or activity. And so they're kind of doing, thing, doing the work because they like it. Um, so intrinsic motivation often is improved when students have choices like we talked about earlier. An example of intrinsic motivation might be when I was teaching in elementary, third grade, I would give sometimes students these um, research poster projects for science. And I remember that I had students that wanted to work on that throughout uh, recess, and they didn't want to stop. They wanted to keep on working on it. They didn't want to go home. They wanted to keep on working on their science project. Or I had students do a, an animal research project, and where they've made their own um, PowerPoint online presentation on Google Slides that they, could, that they would present to the class. And I had students that kept on wanting to make more and more and didn't, once again, didn't want to stop. So when it was time to move on to math or another topic, they wanted to keep on going with that, top, with that activity. So that's one way you can tell if students are intrinsically motivated, is if they're really excited about doing it and they don't, it's almost like they don't even recognize or realize that they're learning in the process. Extrin extrinsic motivation is a little different. Extrinsic motivation would be if someone is motivated by tangible re rewards or results. So most adults are motivated extrinsically when they for work, right? We get motivated based on um, our salary or getting paid. Um, sometimes students are also motivated by things like grades or um, small tokens or prizes that you might have in the, in the classroom. So it's good to have both intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. Those are both useful, but studies have shown that as much as possible, you wanna encourage intrinsic motivation. If students feel like an activity is meaningful and valuable, they see the relevance to their lives, they enjoy learning and they enjoy doing it and they enjoy working with their partners, and collaborating, then they're more likely to be engaged than if you were just going to give them motivation through grades or um, positive or negative discipline. So some ways that you can encourage intrinsic motivation. Well, first of all, one way is just to find topics that students already have an interest in. So Maybe you might do a survey of what students like to, what kind of books they like to read, or what TV shows they watch, or what um, sports or activities they do for fun. And so assigning content that relates to what they're interested in can develop students' intrinsic motivation. If students are not inherently interested in a topic, then in order for them to be intrinsically motivated, they must feel like the subject is stimulating in some way. So maybe it's challenging. Maybe it appeals to their sense of curiosity. It's unusual. Um, maybe it could be something to do with fantasy, like something they haven't seen before, they haven't thought about before. And it's also important if students aren't just naturally inclined to appreciate a subject, you also need to make sure that students feel like they have control over their activity, their learning. So maybe giving them choices or making sure that the activity that you give them is not too difficult, that students feel like they can improve and affect the outcome of what they're doing. So there's different, here's a list of some uh, ways to encourage intrinsic motivation and I gave, um, the citation below. It was 
they were cre created by DeLong and Winter. And so some ways could be novelty, so trying to make it unusual or unique, showing the utility, the importance of something, which is kind of similar to applicability, how they could apply it in their real lives. Um, you could develop a sense of anticipation with students where you kind of build up their interest, like suspense. Um, surprise could also be a way, if it's positive, where your students are surprised with an unusual outcome. A challenge could be a way to intrinsically motivate students where you could explain to them that, yes, this is difficult, but it can be done. And I want to see if you all can solve this challenging problem. Providing students regular feedback that's positive um, can, be, can help develop their feeling of intrinsic motivation. And then also um, developing a sense of closure where um, you have students reflect on why they did this learning. Why was it important? So um, another way to help encourage intrinsic motivation is to think of various different types of examples or ways students could utilize the skills in their lives or um, maybe in future jobs, or even in the classroom itself. And then try to offer the learner as much control as possible. That way, students will have more ability to individualize what they're learning. They'll get to pick texts or um, books or topics that they find the most inherently interesting. And the way they demonstrate their knowledge will be how they personally feel like is the most meaningful way to represent what they know. Also, having students create their own personal goals also makes them become more intrinsically motivated because they want to meet their goals that they set up. Another way to encourage intrinsic motivation is to help support student growth. So focus on the growth mindset. Make sure that students are not just thinking about the end outcome, their grade, or how they compare to their peers, but rather how they personally are improving and why their improvement has meaning, why what improving and getting better in this topic will help them later in life. Um, showing importance and the relevance, of course, can increase intrinsic motivation. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, but posing an activity like it's a challenge or a puzzle or having that inductive learning, which we talked about earlier today, that can really kind of excite students where they have to kind of create their own conclusion. They're the problem solvers. They're the scientists. They're the researchers. They're the detectives. Students enjoy that rather than you just telling them what they should know. There's, now we're going to talk about some specific ways to encourage motivation in general. And these come from Madeline Hunter. So the first theory is attribution theory. And we've kind of already talked about this already. But um, in general, you want to make sure that students develop an internal locus of control. So an internal locus of control basically means that students feel like they are responsible and in control of their learning. That they, based on their effort, they will be successful or not. Um, and external attribution would be the opposite, where you think, Whatever is happening to you is, is a result of fate or some divine power or um, other people's actions. That's normally what you'll see in the classroom is other students thinking that um, other students are at fault for their own failures. Or maybe because of or also based on their internal abilities. Um, sorry, external external um, attribution would, could also be like some, a student thinking that they're destined for failure because they've historically been unsuccessful in school. So instead, to shift the, the focus from external to internal, where students have their own personal control of their learning and their effort equivocates to success, um, you want to make sure that when you notice that students are doing a negative behavior, let's say they're giving up or they're becoming off task, instead of saying so-and-so, you know, you always do this, you always give up, or you always get distracted, 
if you focus on that, that makes it seem like it's beyond students' control. Like, that's just the reality. They're stuck. That's just their characteristic they were born with. Instead, you want to focus on the positive alternative behavior. Like, you might say to the student, you know, if you really work hard and you do this, this, and this, I think you could really accomplish this task. And then when you see that the student is starting to do that or you help the student work with you and you're, they're making some progress, praise that progress and that alternative behavior. And then encourage students to continue to repeat that behavior. Another thing that can motivate students, according to Madeline Hunter, is if students have a knowledge of the results and they also receive cognitive prompts. So students really need to see the results of their learning in the sense that they really appreciate feedback. They need, they need to know quickly, as soon as possible, what they did right and why, and also what they did wrong and how they can fix it. If students know of their results immediately, they're much more likely to continue to persevere and to make sure they, they um, become proficient in that task. Another way to increase motivation is to increase students' level of concern. So level of concern is basically students' feeling of importance. And in the negative way, it could be, I guess, stress or anxiety. Um, so you want to be very careful because if you have a high level of concern where students feel like, oh, this is the end of the world, this is this big standardized test that affects whether they go to college or whether they're going to be successful, then um, if that happens, that might paralyze students. However, um, a medium level would probably be ideal where students feel like it's important what they're doing, it's, you know, they need to do a good job, but they still feel like they can be successful. So they're, they're paying attention. They're not just, you know, playing around, but they, they still, so they feel like the task is important, but they also feel like it's not overwhelming, like it's, it's not, it's manageable. Um, and then a low level of concern would be the opposite, where a student basically just doesn't see the point in what they're doing, or they don't care. And so ideally, you want to increase the level of concern by giving the students um, a medium level where they feel like it's important. So some ways that you can increase the level of concern is to have proximity. So coming by the students, observing what they're doing, giving them feedback. You could increase the consequences of performances in terms of the grade or how it relates to their future work or privileges changing the time level. If you give students too little or too much time, that's not good. You want to give them an appropriate time where they feel some time pressure, but not overwhelming, where they, they worry so much about the time that they don't get the task done. And then also the amount of assistance. So in general, if students feel much more uh, responsible and accountable if they're having to do an activity with their peers. They, want to, they don't want to let the team down. And so if you give more group work versus independent work, students will hopefully rise to the occasion and feel like the activity is more relevant and important, partially because they want to um, please and receive support from their peers. Another way to increase motivation is to increase success. So when students experience success, even little successes, they start to really enjoy that feeling. So maybe having these intermediate, these small benchmarks within an assignment, like after question three, we're going to talk about it and then pat ourselves on the back if we did it right. Or within an activity, breaking it down into little steps and having a way to um, acknowledge students' success and also acknowledge students' effort can be really beneficial because once students experience that success, it's almost like contagious. They want to keep on having it and they know they can be successful. So um, they keep on wanting to do the activity and get that positive feedback and that positive feeling of being, um, of having utility and being successful. Um, another thing that's interesting to note is that 
Um, it's important that success is not too easy, though. Students still need to have some kind of effort they have to put into a task. It can't be too easy or it can't be overwhelmingly too hard. They need to have some effort so they feel like they actually were productive. Also, um, another part of feeling of success is to make sure that the outcome is uncertain. If every student knows they're going to get 100 on the final grade, then they might not put as much effort into an assignment. But if the outcome's uncertain, then they still are in, in unpredictable, then they, and they feel that they can control the outcome, then they're more likely to pay attention and focus on doing a good job in hopes of getting a positive outcome. Another way to encourage um, student motivation is also to increase the feeling tone in your voice. So having a very pleasant, positive tone in your voice can really encourage students and get students motivated. If you have enthusiasm, students will get, become enthusiastic as well. Um, when you promote interest, you could also, a, a six ways to promote interest. So using students in examples, having students design their own problems, connecting it to students' particular interests, you, having students um, each give positive statements about the content and encourage students by emphasizing the progress they've made. Using students as in the example problem or having students come up with their own example problems are great. A seventh way is, according to Madeline Hunter, to use both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation like we've talked about. So um, ideally we want students to be eventually become intrinsically motivated. And so in that case, they'll enjoy learning, they'll pursue things on their own, so they'll be focused on self-discovery and increased learning. They'll develop their own goals and work to achieve those goals, even if there's not a direct reward right away. And also, if students are intrinsically motivated and they start to experience struggle, if they feel like they, the activity is meaningful and that it's valuable, then they're more likely to overcome any obstacles if, that might stand in their way. So they're more likely to persevere and have grit. So we're going to stop here for this first part of the lesson, and I'm going to post uh, the second part. But thank you very much. So please look for part one. I appreciate it. My... Battery is dying, so I don't want to uh, I don't want to stop what we've done so far. So we'll come back for the second part. Thank you.